The video game industry's formal relationship with Hollywood dates back at least to 1976, when Sega released an arcade game called The Fonz, a game loosely tied to the television show Happy Days. A few years later, in early 1979, Atari released a Superman game for the Atari VCS home console. Warner Communications, which owned Atari at the time, released the Superman film starring Christopher Reeve in late 1978 and directed its subsidiaries, including Atari, to produce licensed Superman merchandise. Atari's cartridge, released shortly after the film, is apparently the first home video game licensed to tie in with a film, though in this case the game featured artwork based on the comic book rather than the movie. It was not until 1982, however, that the relationship between the video game industry and Hollywood really took off. 1982 started what the author of Generation Xbox calls a licensing frenzy. There were several significant releases for the Atari 2600 that year, including Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Empire Strikes Back, and the infamous E.T. game. Video games even became significant parts of film plots. Disney released Tron in the summer of 1982, the first film with a story revolving around video games. Tron was followed in 1983 and 1984 by other films with game-related plots, like War Games, The Last Starfighter, and Cloak and Dagger. Despite whatever damage E.T. caused to the video game industry, games based on television shows and films, of course, became a significant part of the video game medium. Some of the games based on films and television shows, oftentimes the games tied to the release dates of films, have a bad reputation. But many other games based on films and television shows are quite good. Some of them are classics. And sometimes the films are even based on the games. So what is the relationship between video game publishers and Hollywood like today? I recently sat down for a discussion about this topic with Patrick Sweeney, a Los Angeles-based attorney who specializes in negotiating agreements between Hollywood and the video game industry. That's this episode of Games Are Not Coffee Mugs. It's Friday, October 17th, 2014, and I'm here with Patrick Sweeney of the Interactive Entertainment Law Group in Los Angeles, or more specifically, El Segundo, one of the beach cities in Los Angeles. Mr. Sweeney's legal practice has involved the video game industry for over 15 years. Prior to starting the Interactive Entertainment Law Group, for example, he was the head of the video game practice group at Reed Smith. The focus of his practice includes, first, the relationship between video game publishers and developers, and second, the video game industry in Hollywood. Earlier today, he spoke to the Intellectual Property Law Group at the Chicago Kent College of Law. He was gracious enough to make some additional time this afternoon to speak with me about the video game industry in Hollywood. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, before turning to the topic of Hollywood and games, uh, I'd like to start with a little bit of background. How did you end up practicing what we typically term video game law? Sure. Uh, back in 1999, I was actually working for Paramount Studios and uh, having a, a great early start to my career at, at, at Paramount, I was dealing with uh, syndicated television uh, licenses and the, the learning curve there sort of topped out and I was starting to look for another challenge and I answered an ad in the Daily Journal which was uh, you know, the, the, the print version so that kind of dates me a little bit and it was, uh, it was an ad for an unnamed video game company and I knew nothing about the industry at the time but I wanted to change from where I was, and uh, and I was lucky enough to get that job. And that company turned out to be Vivendi Games, which ultimately merged with Activision. Mm -hmm. so. uh, now you're a founding member of the Video Game Bar Association, which was founded fairly recently in mm -hmm. 2011. How did that come about? Yeah, um, over the years, I tend to know all of my peers, at, and we see each other at various conferences, trade shows, uh, across the table from a deal. And as the industry has grown and evolved, we thought that there might be an opportunity to uh, get to know some of the new entrants into the space and, and have a, more of a networking uh, trade group that, that was uh, not quite as warranted a few years earlier when there was this much smaller group of us. So, right. so if this had been formed 10 or 15 years ago... <laughs> then five guys are on the five, table. Five guys are on the table. <laughs> uh, now, is it an international membership? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, we have members in, uh, in I'd say, about 60% are U.S.-based, and the other 40 are split between Europe and Asia. And, and roughly how big is it? We've got about 80 members. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, well, let's turn to the relationship between the video game industry and Hollywood. Uh, and we'll start with this example. Writing in Wired magazine in February 2013, Chris Kohler said, quote, The Avengers, The Dark Knight Rises, Skyfall, The Hobbit, 
What do 2012's biggest movies have in common? They're all based on white hot licenses. They're all going to gross over $1 billion each when all is said and done, <clears throat> putting them in an light tier of films. But there's something else they share in common. Not a single one of them was accompanied by a tie-in console video game. Even though they were never any good, movie games were seen as an inevitable fact of life for the gaming world, since consumers still bought them based solely on the strength of the license. It seemed as if there was no way to kill off the movie game business, and then all of a sudden, it disappeared. So did we have a video game movie tie-in crash in 2012? Well, I, I think we did have a crash partially, but if you look at those examples, uh, although technically correct that there wasn't a tie-in movie game for all of those, there are and have been games based on those licenses around the same time. So there, there are plenty of Avengers games out there. there there's Hobbit games, uh, there's a, a mobile game, there's a Lego Hobbit game. Uh, Batman has the Arkham series, and there was also Lego Batman. So, so those franchises had games, and they still maintain the visibility, and they're still a licensed property, although they weren't the traditional movie tie-in game, which, which, as you said, sort of has faded away. Uh, <clears throat> so we need to separate these movie tie-in games into two categories. We had the, the day-and-date releases, right. the ones that were the ones most conventionally thought of as the movie tie-ins, based closely on the movie and released on or about the same day as the movie. And those are the ones that have not completely disappeared, but apparently have become less popular in the industry. That's correct. And, th and those are the ones that traditionally have a shorter production cycle from a, from a game side to try and match up with the movie, have to sync up with the marketing, and the game tended to always be the play the movie kind of, uh, kind of experience, and those tended to be uh, uh, less production value and less of a, a, of a good consumer experience. So those have, had, those have fallen on hard times. Uh, so we could see this as a positive maturing of the industry to the extent these games were being made on the strength of a license rather than the strength of the game, their disappearance is not something we ought to mourn. That's right. But to the extent people do want to play games based on their favorite movies, those opportunities are still out there and they're likely to be based on games that aren't rushed through the production process to be released around the time of the movie, but uh, can still make use of the movie material. Um, That's absolutely right. I mean, you, you take a look at a, a Marvel puzzle quest, right? It's, it's not predicated on you know, playing your way through the movie as a, as a character, but there's still, there's still a consumer awareness that goes with the, the puzzle aspect of it from, from the Marvel character. So there, there's still a validity to that license. Uh, there's still uh, attractive qualities of that from a, from a publisher standpoint that, that make the license something that they want to go after. Uh, did these also become uh, something of a, a risk, given that um, the production of any video game is going to be costly, but as consumers may have grown more skeptical of these tie-in titles, did they just become too big of a financial risk to, to focus even a smaller amount of money on titles that consumers were skeptical of? De definitely. I mean, uh, the, the, the the day and date tie-in title was a big risk. So uh, you, you've got problems with you know retail uh, margins, shelf space, uh, manufacturing, uh, marketing costs, plus now your license fees on top of it. And if it really wasn't a very good game, then then you have a, a very condensed uh, P and L statement, and uh, that, that's not showing much of a return. And you and you combine it with a with a bad game. So that was that was the problem. Uh, you know, there's a, there are other factors in play. The recession in general, uh, companies like THQ, which was a which is a big company that did a lot of licensed properties, they fell on hard times around, around that that period of time. Uh, Disney's acquisition of Marvel and uh, Lucasfilm t took some of those licenses off the table, right, a little bit. So some of those were were a little bit more internal. Uh, and the rise of mobile and tablet, right? It, it uh, you know, people were starting to place their bets in different directions generally at the, around that time. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about how these types of deals are made. Are video game publishers more likely to approach the film and television makers or vice versa? What's more common? Uh, it, it, I'd say it's, it's a little bit of both. Uh, the, the film studios, uh, licensing division, uh, their, their staff, they know everybody on all the main, the main players on the video game side. So they're in constant contact. We see, we see all those guys at the conferences and trade shows. So um, you know, they, they make the rounds and the video game uh, folks sort of make the rounds with the studios to see what opportunities are available. So that, that works both ways. And if they find an opportunity that, that makes sense for both people, they just start talking a little bit more. But, but it's, not, uh, it, it's not one person always initiating the contact. It's just a regular industry contact. Now, is that a change as the industry has matured? If we had gone back to when you started your practice, would it have looked very different? No, it wouldn't have looked very different. I think uh, it, it's been relatively the same. I think the 
the proficiency of the folks on the licensing side of the movie studios relative to games is, is better, right? Before, it was just part of their consumer products group um, that, that there was also licensing lunch boxes and apparel and things along those lines. Uh, they weren't as focused on games, but now they see that as one of the mainstays in the consumer products uh, aspect or the licensing aspect. So they're, they're just more attuned to the, to the industry. Right. Now, when do you think <coughs> that change started to take place when the games went from the lunchbox category and the action figure category into what might be seen as a more complementary creative product. Well, I think I, I, I might still argue that they're not quite as complementary and creative as, as they, they should be, but um, but it has it has evolved. It, ha it, it has evolved certainly on the deal structure side. It's evolved. Um, you know, if you if you look at some of the older deals, uh, you know, they, they they read more like they were deals for a a, a product, a pencil, a lunchbox kind of thing, um, and, and and so the deals relative to approvals and relative to the creative process that goes with a game uh, have certainly been built in there more than I'd say than they used to be, and that's probably happened. In in the last, well, probably about 10 years ago. Yeah. Are there any games uh, that are well known to <coughs> have, have helped the, the process along that have helped uh, both sides to see the games in a somewhat different light? It, can, are there well known examples that might have shown the movie or television industry that these are more interesting than, than well, maybe the pencils? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, certainly back in the day, um, uh, the 007 GoldenEye game was one, one of the more successful licensed properties that, uh, that you know, from, from a game side. Um, the Riddick, the, Rid the Riddick game, uh, Chronicles of Butcher Bay, was actually one of the, the more interesting ones, I think, from my perspective, in that it was the first time that you had the character and you used that world as a jumping off point, but you didn't play the movie. Uh, it was an entirely different storyline for the Riddick character, and that was a pretty successful one as well. Uh, you know, properties like Scarface that were out there that uh, that did pretty well. That sort of dusted off an old an old franchise. Uh, again, that was about ten years ago, I'd say, maybe maybe a little bit more. Uh, so so there there have been a few interesting ones back back in that day. But of, of course, certainly the the most successful ones have always tended to be the sports franchise licenses and, and a lot of the kids ones. The kids ones seem to survive uh, the movie tie-in issue a lot better. This relates to a, a topic that has been given some attention by those who write about the historical relationship be between the video game industry and Hollywood, but uh, there appears to have been a culture clash between the two <coughs> industries that perhaps was stronger in the past and maybe has lessened to some extent, but wh what was the nature of the culture clash between the two industries? Well, I, I don't know if I'd call it a clash so much as maybe, maybe sort of a lack of understanding of where they were coming from. I think the movie studios didn't quite understand back in the day the production timelines for making some of these games, which for the games that we're talking about and the movies that we're talking about, and sometimes were longer than the movie production. So uh, by the time a movie, again, this is more, more back in the day, by the time the movie went through green light, by the time they got you know, all their, their talent locked up and they started uh, moving forward with the movie production, then it trickled down to a licensing department who then start, that started going out and trying to solicit the best offers out there, that's a, you know, you're wasting valuable time and that's the only thing you can't get back in game production is that time. Uh, you've got a finite end date and you're cutting into that production every day you don't make a decision on who your, your partner is. So that, that, that became some of the problem. Was there also uh, a lack of familiarity with the medium on the part of the Hollywood uh, people that they might not know what it is that the game makers can potentially bring to the table? That if, if their recollection is something more along the line of Pac-Man, fairly simplistic, and their exposure to video games is fairly limited, uh, that could uh, that could push the games into the category of the pencils and the launch boxes and things like that. But it may have other effects as well if they're not really familiar with what the game makers can potentially do creatively. Sure, uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to cast everybody with a you know with a broad stroke that they you know they didn't understand or they did, but certainly I think there was some residual aspects of that where they where some of the people didn't quite understand you know how they could potentially work together, particularly on the marketing side. Uh, there was a sharing of assets issue. You know, so, some of the uh, some of the artwork in, in some of the games could be you know and the models could be used in both the film and the and the game production that could streamline and could make the games look a little bit more like the film. Uh, you know, I, I don't always think that there was that level of, of cooperation or sharing. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't because of a, of a greedy. This is mine kind of thing. It's just I don't think they even thought you know, about it. What about a skepticism towards translating certain types of material into a game? If the perception is that games are uh, mainly very action oriented, would that have created problems in trying to 
convince people in Hollywood that maybe something like the X-Files could be translated into an interesting game. Something that's not just shooting things. I'm sure 10, 15 years ago there was that preconception that, that only certain games made for, or certain properties made for a good game. Uh, I, I think that's certainly evolved now, right? You know, when we're talking about you know, you're talking about the success of a Kim Kardashian game, for example, on, on mobile. That's, uh, that's been a remarkable success, and that's something that's a little bit of an out-of-the-box thinking, certainly by, by old-school standards. So uh, that's definitely evolved over time. Um, you know, I think everybody just always assumed that it was, you know, as a console-slash-retail product that was tied to an action-adventure you know, action kind of experience. Okay. So when the uh, individuals from the Hollywood side of things and the video game side get together, other than just reaching a satisfactory amount of money, changing hands, what are the common sticking points that com uh, often come up when deals are being made? Sure. Well, the, I, I'd say the biggest issue that, that uh, you have to deal with is the extent of the rights that are being granted. So, you know, so uh, if you're doing a superhero franchise, are you getting all the characters you need for the storyline for the, for the game? Um, you know, are, are you getting you know the, the 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 characters, the costumes, etc.? So you have to make sure you're getting the, the proper rights on the proper platforms and for the, the right length of time to account for your production cycles and, and your sales cycle. But on top of that, there's there's always this um, this this juggling of sort of the approval process and the, you know the licensor wants to maintain the brand integrity by having a lot of visibility over over everything in the game which is justifiable and by the same token the licensee wants to make sure that they have the flexibility to make the game that they want and and not have to be burdened by repetitive approvals which all they do is uh, ultimately affect the production cycle so so there's a lot of back and forth as far as the which elements are subject to approval things along those lines uh, and i assume there's a lot of variation about creative control. Uh, presumably some uh, movie and TV makers want a lot, some want a little. Uh, Hugh Bowl has said in the press that he got very little support from the companies that license their properties to him, although I'm sure many would say <laughs> if you've made the decision to license to Hugh Bowl, you've already made a decision that the, the movie doesn't have to be very good. Now that would be an example of going from games to film rather than right. vice versa, but I assume the same issues might come up where there are a lot of differences in the amount of creative control different parties want. Yeah, and it depends on the property and it depends on the licensor. Uh, you know, certainly a, a, a Disney is going to ex exercise a different level of control than somebody who's doing a one-off with, with Mr. Bull, uh, who's, you know, whose deals were really more about the, the tax sheltering and the structure that, that was going on at the time uh, you know, for, for the projects he was involved in. But uh, yeah, it's, it really depends on the property and, and, and what sort of uh, track record and history it has. Mm -hmm. uh, it, have the contracts gotten a lot longer over time as people have become more sophisticated and more conscious of these types of issues? If, if I saw a contract <coughs> for, for one of these early deals in the early 2000s or the, the 1990s, would it look a lot different from one today? Actually, I think, I think in some ways they're, they're going to look cleaner and a little more streamlined. Um, you know, so, some of the old ones had very particular uh, avenues where you had to, to spend your marketing dollars, for example, and that was a, more of a retail-focused model. So, uh, you, you know, you had to spend X percent in, in a certain type of store, and you had to do a certain amount on, you know, with end cap, you know, placements and, uh, you know, online banner ads and things along those lines. You don't see as much of that anymore, uh, of that level of, of particularity. You certainly see the marketing commitments and, and some of those obligations, though, uh, but, but not, not quite to that level. Uh, what about, I, I use the example of a few Bowles films, uh, if we're talking about the reverse of the usual direction, mm -hmm. if we're going from a game to a film or a game to a TV show, maybe a cartoon, uh, do those types of deals, are they more difficult, do they raise different issues? They're a little less common, I think. They, they're, they're definitely less common. Um, <clears throat> and as far as w whether they're more difficult or not, you know, I think uh, well, I'm sure Microsoft would say they're, they're significantly more difficult when they, what they were trying to do with Halo. Uh, you know, I think the issue there is uh, the movie studios expect the, the, the licensor in that case to cede a certain amount of control of the brand and the movie studio has to have the creative freedom to do what they want. Which I think is kind of ironic because when on the other side they, they don't allow that level of, of freedom. So, uh, so I think Microsoft in that case uh, you know, it's it's fairly well documented that they went into that with a, a, a very different understanding of that process and then a lack of understanding of, of how the studios worked, um, and, and that caused a lot of problems, so they didn't ultimately get a deal done with Halo, uh, at the time anyway, uh, and, and there's still been on and off talks about reviving it. Uh, but 
but it, it happens less frequently going that direction anyway. Um, but it, but when it does happen and it does happen successfully, the game company slash licensor just ends up ceding a lot of creative control because they have to. It's a different storytelling experience from a from a, a play you know game player mentality to a to a narrative uh, that that most movies are. Now, now, why do you think that is? There um, there are a lot of games now that seem like they would be uh, they would translate quite well into film. Uh, Bioshock, Gears of War. Alan Wake, mm -hmm. uh, Assassin's Creed, and, and maybe deals have been talked about involving some of these, but in general, why do you think there are fewer of the deals going in that direction? I think the film studio is not sure that... They seem very excited about comic books. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so why, why are we not seeing quite as many of the game adaptations? I, I, think, I think from a storytelling standpoint, I think that there's some concerns on the film studios of, of how you develop the backstory of, of a game where there might not have been much of a backstory. You know, you, you take Halo, for example. Um, you know, you, you understand what's going on in, in, in the invasion, the alien invasion, but, but you know, the, the, the Master Chief doesn't necessarily have a backstory or a history that you, you, can, uh, you can play on, but you have to build that in, in, in the Hollywood formula, whether it's a love story or whatever, right? Um, you know, Assassin's Creed, I think, is, is a great example, and they're doing an Assassin's Creed movie. I mean, uh, Ubisoft has established a, their, their own film division. Well, and that's an interesting development as well, that yeah. Ubisoft has decided to take more control of, of that particular one, right? Absolutely, and, and, I, and I, think, I think that plays well for that particular property, because I think that property comes with a, a really built-in Backstory, uh, more of a narrative than, than a lot of the others that that, that you know that we talked about, and more than a Halo, for example. So uh, you know everybody sees the value in the in the potential, but I think everybody's potential is skeptical about you know placing a really big bet. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think the if, if Ubisoft is successful <clears throat> in taking the approach they are, uh, what effect do you think that might have in in in, in how these types of films are made? Well, I, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not as entrenched in the Hollywood side of the business as I am on the game side, but but I think uh, by nature the the entertainment business is somewhat of a of a copycat venture, uh, you know, and just like you're seeing tons and tons of superhero movies now, uh, if if Ubisoft is successful on that, I think you're going to see others trying to do something similar, if not the same structure as Ubisoft did it, they're still trying to do more adaptations in that direction. Maybe not in the way Ubisoft spun it out as its own film division, but you'll still see those opportunities. Uh, well, a, a company like Microsoft clearly has the financial resources Absolutely. to do something similar if they want to. Now, they may not have in-house at the moment the technical uh, skills that they need, but obviously they could acquire them. Uh, so I, I assume that Assassin's Creed might lay an important precedent for whether we start to see some of these other ones made that uh, where a deal couldn't quite be made in Hollywood, but clearly the property has enough appeal that it could warrant a big budget film. You know, as a fan of the Assassin's Creed franchise, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think it lends itself better than most to, to a film. Uh, I'm excited to see that movie when it comes out. I'll, I'll certainly buy a ticket. Uh, but, you know, uh, there's still a lot of elements on the execution side that have to happen, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure they're working towards it. Uh, thinking internationally, we, we talked about the Ubisoft example with Assassin's Creed and Ubisoft is based in France. So that's one international example. But uh, is most of the activity still U.S. based, whether we're talking about games being made into movies or, or vice versa? Well, certainly most of, most of the main game companies are, are U.S. based. Um, and, and, and probably West Coast centric more than anything else. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the licensing opportunities are only, only North American based. Certainly all the major sports franchises have appeal in, in or out of uh, the U.S. And, um, you know, obviously you have to be aware of what the, where the audience is. You know, American football might not play as well outside the U.S. and FIFA might play differently in, in the U.S. versus in some other territories. Um, but but you know, at the end of the day, any of the game companies as, as potential licensees are going to look for a good opportunity regardless of, uh, of what the license is, and they're just going to have to cater it to the right audience, and they're just going to evaluate that. All right. Uh, well, in conclusion, uh, w which game do you most want to see translated into film? Definitely Assassin's Creed. Assassin's yeah. Creed? Okay. Well, yeah. I, I think I'll have to vote, uh, vote for Bioshock. That's another, that would be another interesting one, too. That, that would be a fun one. Uh, all right. Well, I want to thank you for uh, taking some time to speak with me. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Right. Appreciate it.